I didn't see you there. Well, today I'd like to tell you about a book, A Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess. Oh, I didn't see you there. Well, since we're talking about A Clockwork Orange, the first thing that we need to talk about is Anthony Burgess. Anthony Burgess is the author of A Clockwork Orange and he was born February 25th, 1917. He died November 25th, 1993. Interesting fact, he died exactly a month after I was born. I just thought I'd throw that out there. He was born in Manchester, England. Needless to say, he was British. He was a writer, artist, and musician. He chose the name Anthony Burgess due to the thought that his superiors might disapprove of him writing fiction while he spent his time in the armed forces. His first publication during that time was Time for a Tiger in 1956. In the work that we are talking about, The Clockwork Orange, um, the American version and the movie took out the final chapter, which Anthony Burgess did not approve of due to the fact that it gave the main character, Alex, redemption. He married twice. The first wife died due to her alcoholism and had a son with the second. He believed in the interconnection of good and evil. Needless to say, he was pessimistic and died after a long battle with cancer, again in 1993. Oh, I didn't see you there. Well, to, to continue our discussion on A Clockwork Orange, we need to talk about characters. There are a few main characters in the work, but there are a few that just tend to bounce around throughout the book. But I think we'll stick to the main characters for now. The main characters include Alex. He is the main character. He's also the narrator, the protagonist. He's a deviant of society. He's very naive and immature due to he's only 15 years old. A couple of his main characteristics, he loves violence. Absolutely loves it. He also really loves classical music. And that's very important because it contrasts the beginning and the end of the book. F. Alexander. He is Another main character in the book. He is a writer, a political dissident. He is a victim of Alex because he is beaten and his wife is raped due to Alex's shortcomings. Then he's also a user of Alex. He tries to use him as a martyr by trying to get him to kill himself to show the shortcomings of the Ludovico technique. And yes, it's confusing having multiple Alexes in the book. Then there's Dr. Brodsky and Dr. Branham. These are the doctors who administer the Ludovico technique. Dr. Branham is more on Alex's side. He's more caring, more compassionate, even though he is still torturing him. And Dr. Brodsky is the complete opposite. He's essentially evil represented in the book. Then there are the gang members that are part of Alex's gang. There's Dem, Pete, and Georgie. Dem is all bronze and no brains whatsoever. He ends up becoming a police officer later in the third part of the book. Pete is a relaxed, even-tempered character who is pretty important in the beginning and then he kind of disappears for a while due to Alex's incarceration, but then he ends up showing up in the final chapter which was removed in the American edition and in the movie. Then there's Georgie. Georgie leaves an in-gang revolt against Alex which leads to his incarceration. It's not really important because after his incarceration, well during his Alex's incarceration, Georgie dies so he never shows up again. Then there's Billy Boy. Billy Boy is the rival gang leader. He's also Dem's police partner in the third part of the book. Then there's PR Deltoid. He's Alex's probation officer. He kind of acts as a voice of reason for Alex and shows that society still wants to keep up its morals but he never ends up getting through to Alex, so that's kind of a pity. Then there is the Minister of the Interior. 
he doesn't have really a key role in the book other than he is the one that chooses Alex for the Ludovico technique. Then there is the prison chaplain. The prison chaplain shows Alex that man always has a choice and if he doesn't then he's no longer man. But he ends up going with that he should be in the Levito technique as well. So that kind of contradicts his previous statement. Okay, so this is Alex and his gang. They live in a futuristic England. He doesn't really specify on when it is, so for all we know it could be our time period. He has three other members of his gang and they tend to do random activities like drinking their drug cocktail milk or beating up people like scholars, they go and have sex, they rob people, all within this first little portion of the book. The next major thing really that happens is they are driving in a stolen car. They drive in this stolen car out of the city. And they're going up into the mountainside and at the mountainside they find a house. This is the house of one of the characters, F. Alexander, but we don't know that yet. Well, when they get inside, they beat up F. Alexander and they rape his wife. She ends up dying of complications due to the rape, but they beat up F. Alexander to like no extent where he doesn't, rec he, he doesn't realize who they are. They're wearing masks and it's just a horrible event. And F. Alexander is a writer and in the house, they fi Alex finds a manuscript entitled A Clockwork Orange. That comes back later in, later in the book. So the next point is when they leave, uh, one of the gang members named Georgie, this is where he starts the rebellion against Alex. The gang kind of turns against Alex due to his, all of his violent natures which some focus towards the gang itself, but for the most part, they just are sick of him. This ends up being how Alex gets incarcerated. Then that's pretty much all that there is to the very first part of the novel. Okay, so this is the prison. It's called State Jail 48. This is where Alex is put after, after he, well, when he is incarcerated. Um, it's pretty important that he goes to this because this is where the next portion of the novel comes in where he is selected for the Ludovico technique but here is where he talks to the prison chaplain the prison chaplain talks to him about how you're only man if you have a choice and it's his choice with the Ludovico technique it shouldn't be anybody else's it's it should he decide to do it if he loses his choice then he is no longer man no matter the outcome he doesn't agree with his violent acts, but if he loses that choice, he doesn't believe he'll be man. And that's really the main role that the prison chaplain plays. The next point is the Minister of the Interior. The Minister of the Interior is the one who selects him for the Ludovico Technique, and he's like, you're going to the Ludovico Technique. And yeah, he doesn't really play that big of a role other than just to do that. So now he's out of the picture. And for the next portion during Act 2 of the book, he is in a hospital. This is where he meets other two important characters named Dr. Brodsky and Dr. Branham. They have devil horns because Dr. Brodsky, the one with the bigger devil horns, is more evil than Dr. Branham towards Alex. They are the ones that administer the Ludovico technique on Alex here at this hospital. So the Ludovico technique they make him watch violent images on a television show what played to classical music for one of them which is very important because it shows his transition to hatred of classical music but they make him watch this sit and force him to watch these violent acts to show him that they're wrong and they're using mind control to be able to make him hate violence and watching these violent things make him sick so he will throw up and just feel terrible about himself and he doesn't understand why. He even asks, I don't understand why violence made me so sick because violence used to make me so happy. He pretty much stays in the hospital through the end of this part to where he gets uh, released which goes into the third portion of the book. But he has different conversations with Dr. Branham and Dr. Brodsky 
that show his transition from loving violence to hating violence at the end of the technique. So in this portion of the book, he is back in the city. This is after he is released. He tries to go home, but his parents are renting out the room, so they won't allow him to stay home. So they're returning the favor kind of because they are upset with him about what he did, but at the same time, they do feel bad about him not being able to stay. So now he's left out on the street all on his own, and he's still just a teenager. After this, he runs into uh, one of his former victims. The former victim returns all the violence that he placed on him and it's just, pretty much just beats the crap out of Alex. So Alex is to the point where he calls the police. When the police arrive, they end up being Dim and Billy Boy, to one of which was an old gang member of his and the other was the rival gang member. Okay, so Dim and Billy Boy take him up to the mountains where that's where they attack him and they just leave him. They just leave him in the middle of the nowhere and he crawls up to this old house, crawls up to the doorstep, and the man opens the door and it happens to be F. Alexander. At first, neither recognizes each other. Alex is the first to realize it. F. Alexander never figures it out at this point due to the fact that when Alex committed his crimes, he was wearing a mask. Inside the house, he meets other members of F. Alexander's political movement. This is how it turns up to be that Alex is the one that assaulted F. Alexander and ended up killing his wife. So, F. Alexander decides, after he finds out who Alex is, to use him as a political martyr for his movement. He puts him in a room where there's a music box playing classical music. Classical music, at this point of the work, just drives him to insanity. It is consuming him. So what Alex decides to do is jump out of the window of this building. This is what F. Alexander wanted. He wanted Alex to die as a martyr for his cause. It's unsuccessful because he doesn't end up killing himself and he just ends up in a hospital. So then he ends up in the hospital due to the fact that he did not die when he jumped out of this window. He's in there for a couple of weeks where he realizes that his love of violence never truly went away. This is a main key point in the book that shows that he went full circle. He loved violence, then was disgusted with it, then hated it, now is back. He is back to loving it. And this is where he returns to his, uh, his old ways. In the final chapter of the book, he is at a bar where he runs into Pete. When he runs into Pete, he sees how he has a life, a normal life. He's a respectable member of society. He has a wife, he has kids, he's happy. And Alex takes a look at his own life and just wonders, wow, I wish I could have that. Then he looks at his, at what would happen if he had kids. Is it, is it programmed in him that his kids would be violent? And he just goes off and continues down the same path that he always has. And that concludes the book. Oh, I didn't see you there. Well, the next thing on our list are the literary techniques that the author uses. On this list, we have symbolism. First, there's the symbol of classical music. It represents how he has free will at the beginning with his love of classical music, but then towards his hatred, he has no more control over his choices. The next is the A Clockwork Orange itself. It, shows, it follows a similar trend throughout the book. Then there's Diction, his quote unquote mad set, or his random vocabulary that he made up for this book. It's kind of like Dr. Seuss's. Then there's imagery of all the different scenes that they have, include it varying anything from sex scenes to when he's killing someone to it is about anything like when he's in prison. Then there's repetition. He repeats the same few lines throughout the book. There's also foreshadowing when he's talking to the prison chaplain and the prison chaplain talks about free choice which is later taken away from him after the Ludovico technique. Then there's the transition of him as a character because at first he loves violence, it's his favorite thing to do, but then he's turned away from it due to the Ludovico technique, but then he comes right back to it at the end. Well that just about sums it up and I will be heading out. Oh, 
I didn't see you there. Well, every work is based off of set ideas that continue to show up throughout the work. These are called themes. With a clockwork orange, we have a small list of themes. The first is the inability to suffocate human will. First, I'd like to start off with Alex. He has the will to do violent acts. And multiple points through the work, different forces try to suffocate that. First is the Ludovico technique. This fails epically. The next theme is good versus evil. This isn't very direct, like in most works, but it's still very prevalent. Not every character, with the exception of Dr. Brodsky, is good nor evil. There are two different forces acting on Alex, and each force views the opposite as evil and itself as good. So that changes throughout the work. Then there is the theme of sex, drugs, and classical music. In reference to the 1980s movement of sex, drugs, and alcohol, there is sex when Alex rapes uh, the woman. Then there is drugs when he's drinking stuff like his laced milk and other drugs they use throughout the work. And then his love of classical music. This theme shows up throughout until this one changes after the Ludovico technique. Then there is the major theme of government control. The government tries to control everything that happens, including Alex. It tries to control Alex with the Ludovico technique, and it just doesn't work. Well, that pretty much wraps up for the themes. I think we should get on to our next point. Quack. Quack. Oh, I didn't see you there. Well, I guess the next thing on our list is the message and the essence quote. The message is that despite all of our shortcomings, we remain human unless we lose the choice to do so. And the essence quote, me, 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 how about me? Where do I come into all this? Am I like some animal or dog and throwing slaves at me? So I creeched louder, still creeching. Am I just to be like a clockwork orange? As well as, goodness is something chosen. When a man cannot, he ceases to be a man. Well, while I dry off, why don't you listen to me and Ryan's literary criticism? Oh, I didn't see you there. Yarbles, great bullshit yarblockos, do you I'll meet you with chain, or nush, or brinfa, not having you aiming toll chocks at me reasonless in from a clockwork orange by Anthony Burgess. This work is filled with all kinds of words, some based in other languages and others that seem foreign. In Bog or God in A Clockwork Orange, Roger Craig set to decipher the meaning behind Burgess's Dr. Seuss-like vocabulary in A Clockwork Orange. He opens his criticism by setting the stage where Dr. Brenham is the one diagnosing the nadsat in A Clockwork Orange. Anthony Burgess has drive Brenham diagnose the nadsat. He uses this to show that Burgess had given the readers an explanation of his own through a fictional character in the novel. Craig then goes as far as inserting a quote from Burgess himself in You've Had Your Time. While he did explain later in the quote the only explanation he offered at the time of the novel was through the dialogue in the excerpt of his work You've Had Your Time, he does explain some of his motives but also snivels at the idea of a publisher wanting a glossary for the novel. This leads to Craig's next point. As he continues to dig deeper into the motive of Burgess's strange vocabulary he cites the first edition to be published in the United States. This edition was controversial on two levels. One was that Burgess disagreed with the removal of the final chapter which allowed for Alex to have redemption and with the fact that it included a glossary for Nadsat. The edition also included an afterword by Stanley Edgar Hyman. The glossary offered further proof that the language of a clockwork orange that the words have origins both in slavist based words or more particularly Russian-based. He also states that the afterword still stands as the most comprehensive discussion of Nadsat. Craig also points out that many other critics, over the span of the novel's lifetime, have made similar observations. Craig cites many other sources including Jeffrey Egler. In the next section he gets to the point that titled the essay. He investigates as to why none has speculated at the origins of the word bog. It is found in many cases as bog or god which led Craig to the assumption that Burgess was slightly uncertain of the word's capability to stand on its own. He continues with Blake Morrison's belief as to why the term is used. In the third paragraph on through the end of the book he proves his belief. This belief is that it was used as a reference of a sort to Stevie Smith's poem Our Bog is God. The poem uses bog first as a term to say the dog but it slowly and discreetly transitions to a word used for God. He states even though there is no information linking the two writers, he contends that Burgess's love for contemporary literature at that time would have made him very improbably that he was not familiar with her work. To further prove this point he provides the information that at the time that he started the clockwork orange this eccentric English woman poet was approaching the height of her fame. 
To tie everything up, Roger Craig sets out to explore the mysterious origin of Anthony Burgess's strange vocabulary. Through his research, he has found many theories and offered explanation to all while supporting his own that it was a reference to contemporary literature of that time. In his criticism of A Clockwork Orange, Ruben Rabinhoff analyzes the level to which Alex is an individual and the level at which he's merely another one of society. A large part of his argument comes from the true final chapter of the book, published in the English version yet removed from the American edition as well as Stanley Kubrick's film. In the first 20 chapters, we witness the journey of a character whose morals take backseat to his lust for violence. With his tale ending at chapter 20, the reader's attitude towards him is mostly one of condemnation. The reader has little sympathy for Alex other than pity, though even that is minuscule compared to negativity we have towards his actions. The themes of freedom and determinism are the two ideas truly being debated in this criticism. We know that initially Alex's free will is what led him to commit his atrocities and that his exposure to the Ludovico treatment conditioned and mechanized him to the will of the government. However, Rabinovitz brings up the Chinese yin and yang to argue that perhaps the two concepts are foils of each other as they appear, but complements. Mechanism, to Rabinovitz, takes place in the shape of a line, while free will resembles that of a circle. While these two shapes slash concepts seem contrary, the assertion that Burgess displayed them working together is made. Alex's free will of violence is revealed to be more of a programmed desire that he believes his son will have, as will his grandson. Free will is present, though how much of it is societal programming is difficult to tell. This cycle represents the circular motion of freedom slash organic decisions in life. In reality, we are all living on a fine line between our true choices and those that we've been programmed to accept as our own. Anthony Burgess communicated this excellently through A Clockwork Orange, and Rabinovitz elaborated it just as well in his criticism. With this analysis of the novel, we are able to truly appreciate the motives behind Alex's actions and ponder how different ours would or wouldn't be were we raised in the same society. Oh, I didn't see you there. Well, how about a little poetry reading? This is The Fall of Rome by W.H. Auden. It relates to our novel in that it shows that you can't control nature, just like they couldn't control Alex's violence. The piers are pummeled by the waves. In a lonely field, the rain lashes an abandoned train. Outlaws fill the mountain caves. Fantastic grow the evening gowns. Agents of the fist pursue. Abandoning tax defaulters through the sewers of provincial towns. P private rites of magic send. The temple prostitutes to sleep. All the liter literati keep an imaginary friend. Cerebonic Cato may. Extol the Asians' disciplines, but the muscle-bound marines mutiny for food and pay. Caesar's double bed is warm, as an unimportant clerk writes down, I do not like my work, on an official pink form. Unendowed with wealth or pity, little birds with scarlet legs, sitting on their speckled eggs, eye each flu-infected city. Although elsewhere vast herds of reindeer move across miles and miles of golden moss, slightly and very fast. Well, I hope you enjoyed our presentation. I hope to see you again soon.